You're listening to Sustainably Geeky, the podcast for everyday environmentalists. Hi, you're listening to Sustainably Geeky, episode 46. I'm Jennifer, your host, and today I am joined by Christian Shaw, Executive Director of Plastic Tides. And um, as his title uh, implies, he's going to be talking to us today about all things plastic. So Christian, thank you for being here. And um, I guess, can you just start by kind of telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this line of work? Thanks so much for having me, Jennifer. Absolutely. So I'm the executive director of Plastic Tides, and I've been doing that since 2014. Um, however, a little bit more about my background. I'm from Ithaca, New York, in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. Uh, and I grew up in a small town just outside of Ithaca. Uh, my mom's a school teacher, and my dad is a scientist. And I think I was really fortunate to be exposed to a lot of opportunities in the outdoors and the natural world, you know, throughout my childhood. And at a pretty young age, started to really uh, foster an interest in the outdoors and ecology and wildlife. And um, throughout my studies, that, that definitely deepened. And I think probably around high school age is when the sort of looming environmental crises and, and other issues that face our modern society started to, to come onto my radar uh, and just sort of slowly one piece of information at a time build this, this understanding of, of what we were up against. Uh, and so, and by the time I was finishing high school, I was really interested in renewable energy um, and you know, starting to see how I could contribute to solving some of these problems. And I ended up at Cornell University, uh, which is in Ithaca, my hometown, and had an opportunity to study sustainability from a really interdisciplinary perspective at Cornell and was really exposed to a lot of ideas and was able to really broaden and deepen my knowledge of the whole space. And while I was there, I had an opportunity to attend a National Geographic Young Explorers grant workshop. Uh, that was in the fall of 2012. Uh, they were traveling around and that was a really, really uh, serendipitous uh, event for us because it coincided with myself having just really had my eyes personally open to the plastic pollution issue through the work of Five Gyres in my oceanography class. So uh, shout out to Dr. Bruce Monger at Cornell University. He's a really inspiring professor and has opened the eyes of countless students to sustainability in the ocean and conservation and is still doing a ton of work to, ins to inspire students to this day with his ocean list. Um, and so through his, his class, I was exposed to this issue and it was like, oh my gosh, this island of plastic in the Pacific is out there and nobody knows about it. Like, I thought I was an environmentalist and, you know, knowledgeable about these things. Like, how could I not have any idea about this? And so, once again, that coincided with this National Geographic Young Explorers Grant Workshop where they really walked us through, like, the steps to becoming a young explorer and showed us examples of other young explorers. And, and in the afternoon, there were breakout sessions. And so, I had an opportunity to sit down with a group of other students and some some mentors, and I actually pitched an idea to the group to kiteboard. So I'm a water sports enthusiast, and I've been kiteboarding, kite surfing uh, for quite a while. And so I was really, really into my kite surfing at that point. And, <laughs> and so I had this idea to go out to the Pacific and kite surf across the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and get this aerial footage, and it'd be like a trash dump. And hazmat suit maybe and you'd be you know clunking along this this trash dump and then it would open everyone's eyes to this to this problem and well it turns out that 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 idea was super well received by the group and really sent me on my way and so I started digging deeper into this issue and very quickly learned that um, the common misconception that I had that this Pacific gyre was 
like a visible trash dump on the surface of the ocean is actually not true and it's a lot more akin to a plastic smog so you could be sailing through the north pacific gyre and not even know that you were in the most concentrated area of plastics unless you were looking really closely or you know you might see a milk crate bobbing here or a bucket there or some fishing gear things like that but it's not until you get into the water and see that there's this literal plastic smog stratifying throughout the water column because the plastics change in their buoyancy and when they're in the ocean things grow on them and so actually a lot of the plastic that has gone into the ocean to date is no longer on the surface it's settled to the sea floor because it does eventually get colonized and then the buoyancy shifts so it's and literally it's like an iceberg kind of yeah that's actually a great analogy that's a, that's a phenomenal analogy that the pollution like, is like an iceberg yeah if you can see <laughs> yeah what like you can see 10 percent of it on the surface and the rest is underneath yeah yeah, that's I never did that, so that's that's mind boggling. <laughs> yeah, so and so I learned, you know, all this and and realized that this idea wasn't really feasible for a lot of reasons, the logistics of getting out to the middle of the Pacific, all these things. But while I was there, I bumped into a couple um, fellow students, and and we started talking and agreed that we wanted to try and work together on this. And what started out as a kiteboard across the Great Pacific Garbage Patch ended up being a 10-day self-support stand-up paddleboard research expedition around the island of Bermuda. And Bermuda is unique because it's, it's in very close proximity to the North Atlantic gyre. So in each of the oceans, um, well, not each of the oceans, actually, in, in each of the ocean zones, so in the Atlantic there's the North Atlantic and South Atlantic. There's these um, gyres, which are basically a giant whirlpool of currents. Um, and they concentrate plastics in the middle. And so the Pacific is the most well-known because that's where there's the most trash. But in the Atlantic, there's a similar phenomena. And so Bermuda ends up receiving a lot of non-endemic trash. So it's a really good place to basically have like a an island that serves as almost a research vessel to go off into the ocean and document research experience this non-endemic ocean plastic and by when i say non-endemic meaning that it's not being produced and you know polluted by the people of bermuda it's it's coming in from elsewhere in the ocean and landing landing on their beaches and so bermuda was a really amazing place to to look at this and so we decided that we were going to combine adventure and science through the stand up paddleboard research expedition to create a fun, engaging platform to go out and raise awareness and educate people and particularly connect with students, with the youth. And so we did that expedition. And then right after the trip, we went around and presented to about a dozen schools on Bermuda. And that really set us on our way on our current trajectory. Wow. So you just decided I want to do something about this plastic island or iceberg and um, literally went down and, and made it happen, huh? Yeah, we did, you know, and I should add that this was right at the end of university. So, you know, we were all this so plastic ties actually was never supposed to necessarily become a, a lasting organization as it has. It just started out as this one-off project, uh, something that we're interested in that we thought could potentially lead to other opportunities down the road. But after the success of our first expedition, we had, you know, really made something and we had support connected with brands and sponsors. And so from there, we, you know, we kind of rolled right into addressing the microbead issue, um, mm -hmm. which is something I can get into further. But I know we wanted to talk about sort of plastics and their origin story a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, since you, you know, are talking about plastic tides and everything, I guess, can you uh, give our listeners a little more, just a, a quick, I know you're going to get into, as you go through some of the stuff um, about plastic, more what you guys do, but I guess just kind of a broad overview of what plastic tides is and um, 
you know, the kind of work you guys focus on, obviously plastic, but. Sure. So Plastic Tide's mission is to inspire and catalyze action toward a plastic free future through adventure, education, and youth empowerment. And currently, we're really focused on youth empowerment through our Global Youth Mentorship Program, which provides one-on-one -on -one mentorship to middle and high school students around the world who want to take on a project in their school or community that's going to have a lasting impact uh, and solve these plastic pollution, climate change, and other big issues really from the ground up and upstream solutions. Okay. And so, so we're, we're working with our, our Global Youth Mentorship Program and then also focusing on expeditions as well periodically in areas that we think we can have the most impact. And recently we've been focusing on a really critical area on the Mississippi River known as Cancer Alley which is really at the intersection of environmental racism and plastic pollution with frontline communities really, really negatively impacted by all sorts of pollution, uh, namely toxic air pollution from plastic production facilities and other chemical operations, as well as immense amounts of plastic pollution actually going directly into the Mississippi River watershed. So uh, I was on the Mississippi for 10 days uh, last year in April, uh, doing a solo paddleboard expedition, uh, researching nurdles, which are pre-production plastic pellets uh, along the riverbanks and supporting a coalition of groups to stop Formosa Plastics, which is, Formosa Plastics is a, a huge plastics company from Taiwan and they, um, are trying to build what would be the largest plastics production facility to date, uh, two times bigger than any other production facility in existence. And it would also double the toxic air pollution in that region, which already suffers from extremely high levels of air pollution, high incidence of cancer and all these things. And so I was actually down there, you know, supporting this coalition of local groups uh, by getting on the river and lending that perspective as well as contributing to the understanding of nurdle pollution, which if you haven't heard the term nurdle before, it's, it's kind of a funny name, but it's, uh, it's, it's really quite an important issue um, because nurdles are the raw material of plastic. And so this will actually kind of lead us right back into sort of the, the origin stories of plastic. But nurdles are... When a plastic manufacturing facility that makes raw material plastic produces that, they don't make it in a liquid form. They don't make it in a giant block. They make it into these small pellets, and they're about, on average, five millimeters across. And depending on the company, they range in shapes and size and opacity. But the main thing is that these little pellets have the capacity to escape into the environment very easily, especially when there's not a lot of effort put into stopping them from doing so. And so basically these, these huge production facilities are manufacturing, or they're, they're doing chemical reactions to create raw material plastic, and that comes out in the form of these pellets because they're something that can go into bags or go through a hopper. They can go into a train car. So they're, they can kind of flow like a liquid in all these different industrial processes. Um, but in the process of making them, they get all over the place. And the enforcement is such that there's really no regulation of these in the toxic effluent of these production facilities. So what ends up happening is that in their other toxic effluent, so the reason that all this big industry is on the Mississippi River is because it's the only body of water big enough to dilute all this pollution. So they're constantly pumping pollutants into the river in their, their waste stream effluent. And in that, they're also pumping these plastic beads because 
they're just ending up in that waste stream and they're not taking an effort to mechanically filter them out or remove them in any other way and they're not required to do so or really even um, like monitor how many are going out or anything like that so the whole system is is really broken and it's all based on self-reporting for these companies so in in preparation for this this expedition in april of 2021 our team uh, actually calculated that if this plant was built the formosa plant in saint james that it would be emitting on average 10,000 of these plastic pellets per minute into the Mississippi River. And I was on the river researching nurdle pollution, and there's already just a shocking, shocking density of these plastic pellets in certain parts of the riverbanks, such that my, my sample protocol for this is really quite easy. It's you just you start a stopwatch for 10 minutes and you start looking for nurdles. And when you find a nurdle, you restart the watch for 10 minutes. So there's no transact or anything like that. It's just you come to a piece of shoreline, you start looking. And so once you find a nurdle, you restart the, t the timer and then you just collect the nurdles for 10 minutes. And as many as you get, that's your sample. And when I started to get into some of these areas, the, the number that I would have was not no longer a function of like of how many nurdles there were in the area so much as how quickly I could pick them up based on whether they were wet or dry or if there were little leaves and things like that and so you know each sample was in the hundreds of nurdles and it was just me picking them up as fast as I could um, mm -hmm. and so this is all in advance of this new plant being built so once again we were there supporting the Stop Formosa Plastics Coalition, and I paddled 150 miles from the proposed site of this plant in St. James Parish, which is just upstream from New Orleans, uh, to the mouth of the river, and I was following the path that these nurdles would take um, from the plant if it's built. So, uh, are, I guess nurdles, they sound very similar to microplastics, um, which I know we've heard a lot about lately, but microplastics are more after the fact, right? They, they come from bigger pieces of plastic getting broken down. Is that correct? But it sounds like they yeah. kind of have the same environmental impact or, or similar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and they're actually larger than what would typically be considered a microplastic. So, okay. you know, they're, you know, almost half a centimeter. Um, but that's correct. Yeah, microplastics is typically more so from things degrading, you know, physical degradation in the environment. However, in the instance of microbead pollution from cosmetics, you know, that was a microplastic that was going straight into the environment in microplastic form. However, the the dangers of these plastics in the environment are very similar, um, being that primarily they serve to aggregate toxins up the food chain um, through you know amplifying them through the trophic levels um, because one of these beads basically the plastics are absorbent and so they start out as an inert plastic but then they go into for instance a slurry of toxic liquids and they actually absorb quite a bit of that. And so in the case of the microbeads, a plastic microbead in an aquatic environment can be a million times more toxic than the water around it. Wow. And so when this little bead, so they're basically acting like little magnets that, that float around in the water, aggregate these toxins to them, and then they're providing it in a form that wildlife can mistake for food which they do and then they're ingesting it and then you know you get a small fish eats the, the micro bead and then the big fish and so on and and by the time you get up the trophic level there can be a really significant impact which 
there is and which, you know, scientists have been studying and there's a lot of data, for instance, in whale tissue around this, this uh, acceleration of toxic accumulation. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's, you know, so it's, you know, it's not really so much that they're like, yeah, they can be a choking hazard and things like that for animals. But, you know, for instance, New Orleans, everyone in New Orleans loves catfish and that's a huge part of the food supply for people down there. And, uh, and catfish are absolutely eating those noodles. There's, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. So yeah, which means the people are eating them and, you know, exactly. Yeah. Even if we the, care about the animal's health, we should care about the fact that we're going to ingest it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you're not going to, and... you're not going to ingest it physically, the nurdle most likely, but you are going to be ingesting, you know, whatever toxins have accumulated into the, the fish that you're eating. Right. Well, so in addition to, you know, those issues, what are some other environmental um, problems that come from plastic, whether it's the production or after the fact, um, when it, you know, is up in the ocean or in the Mississippi River or just, you know, just in a tree somewhere? I mean, there's, I know there's a ton of issues when it comes to the environment and plastic and people probably just have no idea the impact. Yeah, there's a laundry list of, of impacts, absolutely. And I think, you know, it definitely starts with that most basic level of just the way that toxins are being accumulated, um, you know, throughout food chains, but as well as in the human population. You know, microplastics are definitely contributing to higher toxic loads in people's bodies. And but yeah, going back to just, you know, the the sort of variety of ways that plastic can be a nuisance in the environment, you know, I think um, larger plastics, the physical danger that they create is, is really significant. And, you know, that can be as a choking hazard or for entrapment, um, for instance, with six pack rings and things like that. Um, and the way that they they impact animals like in their stomach as well so the fact that plastics don't break down but that they look like a food source and there have been experiments with fish and other animals that will actually eat plastic and and think that it's filling them up and then die of starvation because their stomachs are full of plastic and so you know the physical danger of the plastic i think is it's really, I mean, it is, it is kind of a long list of things that plastic does, but they all sort of come back to these two main impacts being the chemical pollution, toxic pollution, and, and the physical hazard that it creates um, in a variety of ways. And so, you know, I think sort of the third way that plastic really impacts us as a human society is just visually um, through litter and so forth. Um, and then, well, actually, so visually, but the biggest impact overall is actually in air quality though. So that's the thing. That's what it all comes back to. So, you know, once again, to the pollutants, the, the you know, the through the water systems, of course, there's an aggregation of toxins. But when you talk about these air pollutants, air is the, the, the thing that has no boundaries on the planet. And so, you know, we have private property, all these things, it's great. But when you look at pollution, there's no way to stop pollution from traveling throughout the world. So you know, something you do in India affects the United States and vice versa. And mm -hmm. the production, consumption, and disposal of plastics, the whole ecosystem has a significant negative impact on air quality. Um, Is this from the, the production of it, uh, like when, when they're actually forming it or after or kind of both? That you're talking air pollution every step of the way so 
you know, for instance, in this area known as Cancer Alley with really toxic air pollution levels, a lot of that's coming from the production aspect. But then, you know, on the other end, depending on how things are being disposed of, you have, you know, open burning of plastics. You have, um, you know, incinerators, you know, sort of every different level of, of how it's being disposed of and, and going into the environment. Yeah. The, um, if, if anybody ever wants to get really sad and depressed, there's photos out there you can find of, like you said, animals that have ingested plastic and just bellies full of it. You know, you can either see where they've, they've just basically rotted because they, they died from starvation. It's really sad. Or the, or the turtles or seals that get caught in the nets and, and things. Um, it's very telling. And, and I, I don't know how you can't be impacted when you see something like that, even if it's thousands of miles away. <laughs> it's, yeah, and I, and I know a lot of the a lot of those images have come out of Midway Island in the Pacific with the albatross. So that's that's definitely an area. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's 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 one of those things that it's um, it's sickening, and you know, I don't necessarily suggest everyone go look up those those yeah. photos. No. But uh, but yeah, it's it's helped drive home. <laughs> it does. It really does. It really does. And and I agree with. You with what you're saying about how, you know, like something so distant when you really take it to heart and think about it, what it is, it's, it allows you to see that, you know, our impact extends way, way further than we, than we think. And, um, yeah. Well, what, what I've always been fascinated by and, and horrified at the same time with plastic is, um, it's such a relatively new invention in, by humans. I mean, it's been around less than a hundred years and we've already managed to just impact the planet. So disproportionately for the amount of time it's been around and in the, they say you can find plastic at the deepest part of the Pacific trench and, and, you know, the highest part of the, the, the mountains. And it's just amazing how quickly it's spread like a cancer almost across the world. And we've become so dependent on it. Um, I think I, I read somewhere every piece of plastic ever made has still existed. It still exists today because like you said, it doesn't break down. It's just, yeah, that's true. We use it for five seconds and it's there forever. <laughs> that's, that's so true. And, and it's, you know, the frustrating thing as well is that it's very much a manufactured demand. This isn't, it's not just that society has just gone this direction with plastic pollution, but there's been huge financial incentive and bad actors really pushing us in this direction so you know as you said it hasn't been around for very long so petroleum wax um sorry paraffin wax i should say was was first derived from petroleum um in 1830 um, as well as microcrystalline wax and other petroleum derivatives and so that was really the start of the petroleum era was was 1830 and of course, you know, Bakelite was not invented until the 20th century and then plastics after that. And, and we have really just allowed them to expand throughout the globe. And, and I, I think I've, I've seen that reference as well. When they went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, they found a plastic bag down there. And we were very involved with adventure scientists doing microplastic sampling. And, and that work has shown you know, small pieces of plastic get into the air and have really traveled everywhere around the globe. And, and, you know, it can be a really depressing story to look at, but along the same lines, plastic is a really phenomenal material. It's a wonderful material for, for so many modern applications. And it's really one of those things where we've just been allowed to, to waste it needlessly for for things that can definitely be done in a better way um so you know i think that as much as you know demonizing plastic is kind of in vogue so to speak or like that's you know that's part of the story it's you know just as much like valuing it to not waste it you yeah know, is another perspective you can take yeah, that's a good point because I often think about um, when I'm doing just everyday things with items that contain even a small piece of plastic because inevitably everything we have 
whether it's the boots I'm wearing or this notebook next to me somehow has plastic now in some part of it. And I think, how did people used to function? What did they use instead? And and so there are options out there if we wanted to get really selective and stop being so, you know, I guess generous is the word or indiscriminate with our use of plastic and, and, and really focus on what is it important for. There are medical uses, there are very specific you know, things that it could be best used for and then let everything else be, go back to, you know, wood and glass and metal or whatever. Because we're going to run out of petroleum reserves anyways. And what are we going to do when we can't make plastic anymore? Exactly. Right. And, you know, I do, I do think that at some point there's going to be a massive mining of, of landfills and so forth when it becomes economically viable to do so, to reclaim a lot of these materials. But, you know, I, I've learned a lot. I'm from upstate New York, which is the, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people. And I've learned a lot over the years from just exploring indigenous knowledge and the idea of, of taking decisions out to seven generations is something people might have heard of before, but it's something that really resonates with me. And I think it's a great lens to apply to so many things in our modern world because A solution seems so great now, but if you really let yourself iterate it out into the future, you know, where do you get to? And and the way that we use plastic is definitely one of those things where it runs out pretty quick. And so, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, not just, you know, my grandkids or my great grandkids, but, you know, thinking about society into the future, it's it's definitely I mean, it's it's quite frankly, it's selfish the way that that we're consuming these resources, especially when people before us have shown examples of ways that they can live really fulfilling, healthy lives without, you know, that level of consumption. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for finding a lot of these solutions sort of at the intersection of of modern society with all its benefits and older ways of living for instance you know and actually in in southern africa uh, my understanding is that the the people living there some of the tribes are actually the oldest have been living the, the traditional way for the longest anywhere in the world uh, up to 250,000 years and so you know people will come in and say hey hey like how come you guys aren't you know wanting to modernize and get with you know the new way of life and this and that and it's like okay well from their perspective you know our people have been living like this for 250,000 years hundreds of thousands of years you know with abundance but in in harmony and balance with the planet and well you guys have been at it for 250 years maybe and (laughs) you're you know you're already running out of uh runway so it's I think it's a tough argument probably to make. Yeah, yeah. the perspective is, is off for sure with a lot of modern day folks. Um, well, while we're talking about kind of looking to the future and making sure we do, you know, right by the next generation or seven generations, um, let's, I guess, talk about the sustainability of plastics. And specifically, I'm thinking recycling. We hear a lot about just recycle it, you know, if it has the, the number on it or if it has the triangle, you can recycle it. So so in that sense, I think a lot of people use that as a pass to just keep, you know, consuming as much as they can, plastic or otherwise. Um, but we've also heard recently about the problems with plastic recycling, and I, I kind of want to get your perspective on this. Um, why is, is recycling maybe not the best solution for plastic um, specifically and are there other alternatives you know when it comes to disposing of it yeah that's a great question jennifer and and plastics recycling is really one of those complex issues and it's an area where society as a whole has really been duped into thinking that it's a viable solution where it's it's really not and the science has been there for a very long time Since the 60s and 70s, plastics company executives understood the chemistry of plastics and that they are not financially viable to recycle. And the primary reason being that every time you heat up a plastic and remold it, that 
it degrades physically. And so a large part of why plastics recycling is so attractive to plastic companies is because it requires the introduction of new plastics to attain the necessary characteristics often. And so, sure, it's not to say that there aren't applications for recycled plastic in the various levels of, of degradation, uh, but they become much, much more limited you know, every step of the way. And unlike materials like glass and aluminum that can be melted down and reformed infinitely without losing their structural integrity or material properties, um, you know, plastic is, is not so. And there was actually a uh, deliberate and concerted effort by the plastics industry. And there's a great podcast from NPR called Waste Stream, NPR's Planet Money, uh, that goes really deep into this. But the, the plastics companies figured this out in the 60s and 70s that it wasn't viable to recycle plastic and came up with a scheme to really co-opt the the goodwill and habits of of people that had been developed throughout the the World War II era and beyond in terms of sorting and recycling materials like tin and aluminum and glass and and sold this idea that plastics needed to be you know, a big thing that we recycle as well and really invested in the infrastructure, recycling plants and so forth to make that possible um, and and really just propagated this idea that, oh, it's fine, drink your bottled water and it's okay, I recycle, just toss another one in the bin. And, um, and that's just a total lie, really. So when it comes to plastics, we just need to completely rethink the way that we use them and have an understanding that yeah when when something is made from plastic yeah it's still good to try and recycle things um however the the recycling system is definitely up against up against the bars because um and and I think at this point it's it's really goes from like a locality to a locality basis in terms of what's actually going to happen to your recycling uh, because the system has been so stressed um, in large part due to the fact that a lot of the quote-unquote recycling that was happening was really just plastics being bundled and sold to Asia uh, either to be burned or used for other things uh, not actually recycled in some cases just landfilled and, and in many cases um, very irresponsibly landfilled um, and and so a lot of these Asian countries started cracking down on that, and and that just put a huge wrench in the in the whole system in terms of U.S. recycling. So a lot of recyclers are are very stressed, and I think as a consumer, it's almost better to assume that no plastic that you buy is going to be recycled, um, because. We already know that on average only about 10% of plastic actually does get recycled. Um, and that that's also based on perhaps a somewhat faulty paradigm as well. So, you know, I, like I said, I think it's best to just assume that your plastic isn't getting recycled and, and treat it that way. And so the better option would be just not to use it in the first place, it, you know, buy something in a different material or reuse it um if you can if you get like a butter container like you know your grandma used to use as your tupperware <laughs> save those to hold things or or whatever the case is i think yeah absolutely absolutely and you know avoiding as much as possible reusing when you can and i know it's complicated especially when it comes to food and this is the the really the most challenging thing because i'm very passionate about sustainable agriculture um agroforestry, regenerative agriculture systems, um, and plastic pollution and food systems are so intricately intertwined. A huge amount of the, the plastic pollution, particularly single-use plastic pollution that's created, is directly connected to food. And 
and a lot of times connected to unhealthy food. So, you know, I think one of the really exciting things about sustainability in general from a personal level and particularly plastics is that it doesn't need to be, well, it, it shouldn't be a negative thing. I mean, really living in a more sustainable, conscious way, uh, I can guarantee will bring more positivity and joy and benefits to your life. And they can also, it can also help your wallet and, and even more importantly, your health. Because when you, when you really start to look at these things and set guidelines and for yourself, the, the avoidance of plastic and, and just sort of trying to support healthier food systems and so forth is going to be putting better food on your plate. And yeah, there might be a cost uh, sacrifice, uh, but, and, and I think that, that comes down to individual choice. Um, you know, everyone has different financial constraints that they're dealing with. Um, but I do, I do believe in most places that it's, it's possible to eat healthy, fresh food without killing, killing your wallet. And, um, but I, but I also think that it's, it is a, a value, uh, you know, it does also perhaps require a shift of values in society wherein, you know, we, we really have a value for consumer goods and, and different things that are rather expensive but you know people will scoff at the price of of uh ethically produced you know high quality food um but when you look at you know life and what sustains you Mm -hmm. at least for me it's it makes a lot of sense to to value what you're putting in your body over you know physical possessions and so forth so um yeah, I don't remember the exact statistic, but um, I, I read somewhere that, you know, two or three generations ago, we were spending maybe 30% of our income on food, and now it's it's less than 10, I think, because the cost of food has gotten so artificially low because it is mass-produced and it is made in a way that is, you know, it makes more of it, but it's not necessarily better food, and it's highly subsidized. So we're not paying the true cost of the food. And I think if people had to start paying that, um, their priorities might be shifting and they might be able to, like you said, to really, like, if I'm going to have to pay more anyways, I may as well pay for the, you know, the ethically produced um, thing rather than have to continue to pay $600 every time a new phone comes out or whatever. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, one thing that that I think a lot of this can come back to is voting with your dollars for the future that you believe in and that you want to live in. Because, you know, depending on where you are in the world, you know, whatever governmental system you have, you know, we all have, there, there's ways to impact society and, and so forth through democracy and voting and, and these different avenues. But the, the fastest, most effective way to influence, uh, the world, especially in a free market economy, is is through your money. Because when you buy something, you're you, every time you purchase something, you're sending a signal to the person who made that to make more of it. And and especially when it comes to you know food that's produced in an ethical, healthy way. Um, right now, a lot of things are more expensive. You know, for instance. I buy pasture-raised organic eggs. I try and get my eggs from someone I know as much as possible. Um, and yeah, that costs more, but the more farmers that see their neighbor getting a good price for their eggs that they're raising a certain way, the more they start to think, oh, I wonder if I change my you know, operation to do that and I could get that higher price. And then that's what really allows more people to to start doing things in a certain way and then that brings the price down and benefits everyone yeah for sure i know we're starting to kind of veer into a different topic altogether um where (laughs) it comes to access to food and and uh you know it, it there is kind of an ethical argument i guess as to not everyone can afford it. Not everyone has that uh, privilege because of 
bigger problems in the economy and society at large and, um, you know, generational wealth and all that. But um, I, I do think it's an interesting, you know, problem to think about um, why we value what we value and how do we, like you said, start to um, get to the point where we put we're willing to, I guess, um, pay more for the things that matter the most and not the, the things that the capitalist feel as we should. Yeah, and actually it's, um, it's kind of putting your money where your mouth is in the most direct sense, right? Right. What's going in exactly. your mouth. <laughs> well, we kind of um, touched on this a little, but are there any other ways that you would suggest for folks to reduce their reliance on plastic, whether it's at a personal level or, you know, at a society at a larger level? I think, you know, food systems is definitely the most critical high impact area. Um, and then water is the other super important thing. So just have a water bottle, don't buy bottled water, period. Yes. Uh, you know, access to clean, free drinking water, I believe should be a fundamental human right that every every modern society upholds uh, and yeah, honor that and uh, respect it and take advantage of it. Drink, drink clean water and don't drink it out of plastic. So I think that's another huge thing. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bottled water is the worst. <laughs> and then yeah. actually the, I guess the last area, uh, that is really important to touch on is is clothing and fashion because um, a lot of fabrics have synthetic components and so the whole fast fashion industry is actually a massive polluter. One of the biggest, the fashion industry is, I don't have the numbers in front of me so I don't want to misquote, but it is a significant impact uh, globally. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of that just comes down to this fast fashion and the idea of always needing to get new clothes and new trends. And, and so, you know, and I think that's also an area where leaning into quality, you know, benefits you as an individual and the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, shirts shouldn't cost a dollar or, you know, like new, new shirts shouldn't cost, be so cheap that, and, but then they fall apart, you know, like, like you should get something that is better quality. That's actually going to last you and not just be thrown away after one or two wears. It's, it's ridiculous how flimsy clothing is now. And yeah, <laughs> just like everything else, it's, it, it's a whole other, uh, a whole other discussion, but, um, yeah, there, there is a, a lot of, um, microplastics that leach out of some of the synthetic clothing you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of Another. microplastics into the environment through like the washing machines and so forth. But even beyond that, just the actual like physical plastic produ production footprint of the manufacturing of the clothes, the shipping and well, not just plastic, but, you know, fossil fuel impact of of transporting everything, but then also packaging things. Um, so, you know, that's where a lot of the plastic is generated and then actually in the the materials themselves. And if those materials are, are breaking down after however many uses and then ending up in the landfill, you know, that's no different than a plastic bottle or a plastic bag going into the landfill. Yeah, I see shirts and, you know, shoes and things that say they were made from plastic bottles. Um, and and at first I thought, oh, that's really cool. And then I realized they're probably leaching a lot of plastics or causing issues in the way that they're made as well. So I, I have to look more into that. I don't know if you know enough about those. Yeah, no, it's uh, funny. I'm, I'm, well. I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because it is one of those sort of difficult areas to navigate. And, and we've, you know, we try and one of the ways that we, you know, support our programs is through uh, corporate partnerships. And it is interesting trying to sort of find that balance with companies because this creating things out of plastic bottles and recycled plastics has become such a buzz. And it, 
unfortunately, it's really mostly just greenwashing. And yeah, sure, it's great to be putting these things to use, but at the same time, I think it's being used so much more effectively by the industry to promote more use of of things like single use plastic water bottles. Yes, it's being it's being leveraged so heavily to promote more consumption um, that the the you know the positive impact of reusing these materials is really quite quite small. And and you know once again, when it comes to you know materials, clothing, all these things, you know there's ways to produce fibers and so forth from you know, healthy, vibrant ecosystems, um, you know, mm-hmm. so. It's, well, and I'll uh, be the first to admit, I've, I've jumped on that bandwagon and bought something because it was made from recycled this or that. But I, I think it's just worth repeating that anything that so- sounds amazing and too good to be true probably has some caveat, like you said, and just to think beyond the tagline of, you know, whatever the new fad is, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Okay. Well, is there anything else we didn't get to talk about? Anything else you want to share about plastic tides or just plastic in general um, before we wrap things up? I don't think so. I think, you know, just circling back to the idea that, you know, this this journey of you know opening your awareness and your consciousness to sustainability, plastic pollution and and supporting a more healthy vibrant you know global community is should be fun and positive and and it really is and so as much as it's it's necessary to point out these things that are going wrong in the world and and problems that we need to solve i do want to end on a positive note and just say you know just dive in and and see for yourself um you know the joy that can come from just opening opening your consciousness yeah, that's a great message. Um, do you have any resources that you would like to share with our listeners? Things that helped you, books, podcasts. I know you mentioned one. Um, ideas, you know, for if, if they want to learn more or, or get more involved in this space. Sure. Yeah. So, all the videos from Story of Stuff are really phenomenal. Uh, the Story of Plastic is is the most recent one, um, and there's actually a a full length film called the story of plastic now. Um, but anything from the story of stuff, if you, if you want to dive deeper into these issues and how they're sort of connected systemically throughout society, um, but in a fun, concise format, uh, that's really great. Um, and you can follow us, uh, plastic tides at plastic tides on all the social media, uh, to stay up to date with our latest work and as well important issues that we're putting a spotlight on, particularly uh, the Mississippi River and Cancer Alley region and, and the work that we're doing to try and halt the additional construction of plastic production infrastructure uh, down there and and really stem the flow of plastic into society at the source. Um, and you can follow me at Chris Cross Shaw on Instagram and yeah, get out there and have some fun. Awesome. Um, well, we are at the part of the show now where we give our listeners a green life hack, which is just something that they can do, or maybe a product or something that you've discovered that will help them live more sustainably. I know we don't want to encourage people to go out and buy more stuff, but um, if there's, you know, something you have that you would share with our listeners. My green life hack is to find someone that lives near you and get some food from them. Doesn't matter what it is. Find someone local that you can create a relationship with and that provides some part of your diet and, and go out and, and find that person, make that relationship and add that food in, into your diet. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Eating local is a great green life hack. And 
I mean, you usually find the best food that way too. So <laughs> it's a win win. The best food and the best relationships. And, and that, I don't, don't forget that part, you know. Um, I think that's something that's missing in so many parts of society and, and uh, it just creates so much uh, warmth and, and uh, richness and, and canon in, in our society and, and everyday life. So, Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, mine is also kind of food related and I was trying to think of something uh, plastic related for the show and, and you know we've done so many of these over the years um, and usually it's bring your own straw or bring your own to-go container or, or basically just a swap you know don't use plastic use this instead um, so I didn't want to duplicate any of that but um, you know I, I just got back from being out of the country for a month and I have to restock my my kitchen and I'm going to the farmer's market Saturday and so I'm just trying to think through okay what are all the things I can bring in order not to use plastic bags there or um, to maybe give back containers to the vendors so um, I've got egg containers that I'm going to give back back to the egg lady I've got um, jam containers I'm going to give back to the jam lady and when I get my cheese, I'm going to try to take a Tupperware instead of using the paper, you know, the wax paper that they give me. So um, I guess my challenge for people is just maybe try to think through other creative ways you can reuse some of these things, whether they're plastic or not. Um, and you may or may not be fortunate enough to have a farmer's market in your area. But if you don't, um, maybe talk to the butcher or you know, your, your, the things that you're using and, and also help your, your vendors out because I'm sure they'll love to have all those, you know, cartons or whatever the case is. So that's mine. <laughs> it's I love not that. super great. crazy, but it's doable, hopefully. So, <laughs> um, well, Christian, thank you so much for being on again. And um, I'm going to let you plug uh, yourself and Plastic Tides one more time where people can find you online how they can get involved and um yeah go for it awesome thanks so much jennifer yeah once again at plastic tides on social media at Chris Cross shaw and then you can reach out to me directly christian at plastic tides with any questions comments ideas i'd love to hear from you okay and that's chris with a c in your c h r i s t i a n okay great and you can find me, of course, here on Sustainably Geeky. I will be on the next episode of Marginally Geeky, where we're talking about breeding sweetgrass, um, which I'm really enjoying. I'm sure you're familiar with that book because she's from up there. Um, I am. Very, I'm, 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 I've been listening to it while I cook for about the last nine months. Really, really enjoying um, it. And, I started uh, listening while hiking, and it, it's just like the perfect book to listen to when you're outside. It's, it's all about connecting with nature and indigenous knowledge and food. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's been very peaceful. Yeah, we have that at the end. Um, the show itself is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Sustainably Geeky. We're also on YouTube and anywhere you listen to podcasts. So please subscribe, share us, um, give us a five-star rating, a thumbs up, whatever they allow you to do, and um, let your friends know. And Christian, again, thank you so much for being on. I learned a lot, and I hope um, our listeners did too. So for awesome. everyone listening, Thanks, Jennifer. have a great rest of your day.